happens though that when just once in Carla I was visiting Canada and the United Kingdom I was actually in Delhi visiting the widow's colony and I didn't know that at the time that that's the time of his speech and so when I was visiting those mothers in the widow's colony it was 10 years after 84 the very message that they were giving to me and sharing with me something that left me for a very long time and made me interested in human rights is that the world had forgotten them and actually, there was very few people in India at that time, human rights organizations, just once in Cairo was one of them, Fulka has been one of them, and many others that took on the plight and went to seek justice um, for so many of those families. And actually what just once in Cairo unearthed um, was just um, shocking. And I'm really pleased that people like Sadbal Singh Baines, who's also on this call that will be delivering the lecture, have actually taken on his work, as, he, as has his family, his wife, his daughter, who's also joined us on this call, Nadir and Gore. We're very grateful um, to have you with us. Um, but the work that they have been doing and seeing them really at the forefront um, has been just so inspiring. And I know it will inspire future generations to come. I want all people to know about who just once in Kailara was. You know, there is still so much work that we need to be doing to educate our young children, um, our future generations, so they absolutely understand you know, that the very fact that Sikhs haven't had the privilege of the freedom of religion and belief in their very home country in India. And I want to see freedom of religion and belief um, as, as the co-chair of the all-party parliamentary group on Forbes, actually. Um, it's something that I'm very, very passionate about, as well as within my shadow brief. Um, and I'm really delighted that we've been joined by the um, UN Special Rapporteur, uh, Ahmed Singh Shaheed, um, on Forbes, um, who's joined us. So just very quickly reiterate um, that today we're also going to see the launch of the book um, by, um, th this is the wonderful book by Gurmeet Gaur, um, which I had delivered today and I haven't had a chance to read, but I'm, I'm really delighted. I've got books here for MPs that have joined this call um, so that they will get their own copy. Um, so really delighted that Gurmeet Gaur um, is going to speak to us and, and tell us about what inspired her to write the book. And then we've got Navgiran Gaur, who's joined us from California. She's just Kalra's daughter, and she will deliver a vote of thanks. Uh, we've also been joined by Rajinder Singh, who lives in the UK. He is just once in Kalra's brother. So great welcome um, to him. And, and, and as I said, there are many MPs and Lords that will be joining us throughout this event. Of course, there is a vote in the House of Commons at the moment as well. Um, but I want to thank everybody that's watching um, this event through KTV satellite channel, YouTube channels of United Speaks, Carlos TV and Basics of Sikhi and Facebook Live from Boss. And I want to thank the organisers, especially Manjinder Balkor from United Speaks, uh, Boss, Sikh PA, who's the media partner and CAP Freedom of Conscious um, that has supported the event. Um, so I now want to hand over um, to my co-chair Manjinder Balkor, she's a human rights lawyer, a former journalist, who serves minorities and the underprivileged as the International Legal Director of United Speaks. She began work on a rural project called PASS, which is Punjab After School Study, which serves 2,000 government primary school students in 33 villages. And Manjinder Bal divides her time between Punjab, the UK and Malaysia. So over to you, Manjinder Bal. This one thing, Karl Rai hasn't just left us a legacy, he's left us a duty. Because uh, from reading uh, Gurmeet Kaur's book, where she clearly states that just one thing was a completer. Someone who believes that if he has started something, it must be finished. Because his life was taken in the way it was, uh, last week was the date that the courts have recognized that his life was taken on the 28th of October in 1995. And therefore, he could not continue to complete his work. And therefore, the duty lies on the shoulders of people like Satnam Singh Bans and everyone else in this room to ensure that this one Singh Kalra's work is completed. Listening to Satnam Singh Ji talk about the work that has carried on since this one Singh Kalra must give a lot of solace to the world. And this one Singh Kalra must be smiling that my work may not yet be complete, but I've left behind lions and lionesses who continue to evade the, the, the hunter and continue his work. It is really important that we also uh, use solemn occasions like this um, to honor the memory of, of Jaswant Singh Kara and of others like him who have done such sterling work 
uh, to ensure that rights of everyone are protected, that democracy is strengthened, and that the voiceless uh, don't go voiceless, that, that they are spoken up for by people who care. Um, I also want to spend a moment to pay tribute to his, to his memory, to honor his memory, to remember his work, and join all of you this, this, this afternoon uh, doing that. Um, as all of us know, uh, he was cruelly kidnapped in 1995 while he was investigating extrajudicial killings of Sikh activists in Punjab. His work um, was in instrumental in documenting vital evidence with regard to about 25,000 um, deaths of, of Sikhs at the hands of the authorities. And of course, seeking to end impunity for those atrocities is vital. And he repeatedly petitioned Indian courts on behalf of the families and loved ones to get them uh, justice. And the, the key lesson we take away from his work is the importance of that, how that inspires other people, and how that is so important uh, for those who have been denied justice, despite the passage of years, to keep on pursuing, pursue, pursuing that. The rights of the individual are uh, belonging to an ethnic, religious, or linguistic minority, such as the Sikh community in many places around the world, are uh, uh, enshrined international human rights framework with strong protections. Article 27 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, if you like, the keystone uh, of the human rights framework, um, as well as the UN Declaration on the Rights of Persons belonging to national, ethnic, or religious minorities, one of the most detailed doc documents outlining what states must do to protect the rights of minorities, provide uh, these standards and guidance uh, for states in how they should respect, protect, and promote rights of minorities. Of course, there are also very strong protections woven to the entire rights framework on rights to equality and non-discrimination of all persons, which apply, of course, therefore, to minorities um, as well. In addition to promoting the right to respect, protect, and promote rights of minorities, states must ensure that minorities can take part in decision making about not just not just about their own life, but about the state they, they are in, and of course to enjoy their own culture, to profess and practice their own religion, and of course to use their language. And as you referred, uh, Co-Chair, that the Sikh community throughout the world has faced restrictions, including in, in the name of, if you like, security, uh, in, in the way they have, governments have intruded into into core elements of Sikh identity as part of that process of, of pursuing, pursuing security. Um, of course, therefore, implementing these measures requires states to take clear uh, uh, legal provisions and, of course, policies uh, to support that. And linked to that, of course, is, the, is Article 18 of the ICCPR, which you referred to, the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion or belief of all persons, regardless of whether or not they are in a majority or are in a minority. And we see throughout the world that when states respect this right, there's a, there's a high level of respect for freedom of thought, conscience, and within a belief, such communities thrive. They, they have much better, if you like, political stability, economic, so economic prosperity, social, cultural uh, flourishing. And of course, each member of society, of society also feels safer and more empowered when there is strong respect for this right. By contrast, and as we see in many parts in South Asia at the moment, when there is suppression of these rights, they are accompanied by further strife, uh, further violence, more extremism, more inequality, and more despair and, and, and deprivation. So there's a clear reason, even from a pragmatic perspective, respect everyone's right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion or belief. Despite this clear message, which has been shown by empirical evidence, huge gap exists between respecting these standards uh, and, and aspirations for these. So as UN Special Rapporteur, I identify and respond to existing and emerging threats to freedom of and belief around the world, often with an acute focus on rights of persons belonging to religious or ethnic min minorities. You mentioned, uh, you referred to my, my upcoming reports, and I have two, if you like, on the drawing board. Um, one will be September next year, because this November, we will mark the 40th anniversary of the UN's declaration on the elimination of all forms of intolerance and of discrimination based on the belief. The most detailed document that exists in terms of what right state ought to protect for religious minorities. And I think for the Sikh community, there are key elements in this document that needs to be, be uh, protected. And I, I call upon you to look at this document and to use it as a way to lobby uh, for your rights. I shall be doing a report on this one year, one year's time, look at how states have 
uh, respected this right. And in South Asia, and as well as neighbors to the East and West, the violations are rising. And I'm very keen to hear from the Sikh community, the ways in which my mandate and my fellow reporters, right, uh, reporter on minority rights, reporter, reporter on uh, uh, transfer justice, can be helpful in upholding, upholding your rights. And one common, um, if you like, um, challenge we face in South Asia, and again, in many parts of the world, is impunity. Not only, not only are states directly violating rights of communities like the Sikh community, but also they are responsible for, for impunity when other actors uh, uh, harm them. And this toxic cycle spirals into, in, 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 into, more, in, in, into more violence. Uh, we see that um, in Punjab, uh, the thousands of extrajudicial killings that that um, that occurred many many years ago um, still remain, if you like, unanswered to. And and I think the impunity for perpetrators is one of key, one of key drivers of future, if if you like, future violations uh, as well. So it's not just the Sikh community that faced this challenge of impunity. Like I said, in South Asia, other minorities uh, face this, and even today in India, the situation hasn't really improved. And we see to India's or South Asia's west in Iran, what's going on uh, in Afghanistan as well, and to its east uh, can go up as far as China uh, and and North Korea to see how these rights are being being violated. So so impunity and state repression um, are are if you like um, challenges for all communities everywhere, especially when they when they appear as minority communities. And of course, even when they're a majority, if a state is repressive, the state is intolerant. Nobody escapes the, the, if you like, the long arm of the, the repressive law, uh, as it were. And as you refer to in the COVID-19 pandemic, everywhere minorities have been further targeted. It's, it's been a stress test which has brought out the worst in most states. Again, so society as well as governments are discriminating against minorities. The question is, what must we do or can we do? I want to remind everybody that last year, the UN adopted uh, August 22nd as International Day to commemorate victims of acts of violence based on religion or belief. The word victims, unfortunately, I like to call it survivors or torchbearers as we have been using, using this evening, but nonetheless, the, the word is victims. So the point I'm making is that this is a day that we can all you know, use to highlight, the, if you like, those awaiting justice for the violations of, of their rights. And I call upon Sikh community to work with me and others for next year's event to make sure that we make a, make a higher pitch uh, for, for justice for, of, for victims of violations of, of, of rights from years past. And what is required here for states is that they must focus on redress and remedy for those who've been, who's also been violated, including full restitution, rehabilitation, and guarantees of non-recurrence, which means stronger rule of law, and of course, building, building resilience in society. So these are big challenges, big demands, but we have to make sure states actually do live up to them. And to guide states on this, the UNOS has declared basic, it's called basic principles and guidelines on the right to remedy and reparation of victims of gross violations of international human rights law and serious violations of humanitarian, humanitarian law. Again, this, these principles stress the importance of restitution, compensation, rehabilitation, satisfaction guarantees of non-repetition. So how do, we, how do we pursue? How do we make sure states do that? Of course, if states are in denial, if, if, if they refuse to acknowledge this, there are various UN mechanisms that can be resorted to to highlight these concerns. I have been, and my colleagues have been raising concerns with various governments about violations of, of Sikh rights. And we would see that in the aftermath of the 9-11, so the secular damage is coming here. There, there, there's been a rise in attacks on Sikhs uh, on the mistaken notion that Sikhs look like Muslims are, are Muslims. So my current report, next report in March, looking at anti-Muslim hatred, will look at attacks on persons because they believe to be, to be Muslim, and which of course is often the Sikh community as well. And in terms of what do we do when states refuse to acknowledge their responsibility? Well, examples are there from, from, from other countries, Iran, uh, China. People have formed what are called people's tribunals. Obviously, genocide is something only, only a court can, I think, uh, uh, declare. Uh, the being case when parliaments have declared this, but I think it's authority should, become, uh, should come from courts. But people's tribunals have been very effective in documenting uh, violations and making the case that certain, certain type of atrocities require certain types of, of categorization. This also requires guaranteeing space for civil society to fulfill its, its, its role in ensuring that there is space to do this, to do this work. And the reason why I think it's so important 
for us to remember the work of people like you know torchbearers like just one seeing kara survivors champions uh, of, 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 of his work is that they do so at great risk to their own life but when they do so they make tremendous uh, uh, progress they have made sure that people who've been if you like disappeared will not be forgotten and it's so important for those who've been harmed that their memory is cherished that they have solidarity they have that they have their, that their survivors I have solidarity and then we work with them. So as Jaswan Singh Kara once said, and I quote here, when darkness is trying to overwhelm truth with full, truth with full strength, then if nothing else, proud Punjab like a lamp is challenging this darkness. So I think, end of quotation, I think that challenging of darkness is so important that we all come together, stand up as torchbearers and light uh, and, and shed a light on that darkness to ensure that we can see what, what's going on. Today, I encourage you and, and join all of you to continue his noble legacy in shining light of truth on human rights violations whenever, wherever, and by whoever's hands they occur, thereby displaying the darkness for all and everyone. It's a real honor and privilege to launch this very important book, The Valiant by Gurmit Kaur today, about a very inspiring, inspiring personality from whom all of us should draw inspiration, courage, and of course, guidance to the work we do. It will serve as, serve as a very fitting tribute. It's, it's a very quiet yet defiant statement, reminding his cruel abductors that they could take his body away, maybe his life, but not his spirit, and not the light that he spoke about. And I think it's so important to keep reminding everybody of his valiant work, of his great work, the younger generations, to inspire them to do a similar sort of work because the work goes on, it's, it's, a, it's a tall task. But also, one of the most important things it, it does is to those Sikh communities back in Punjab, remind them or, or to, to tell them of, of the great work done and, of, and give them hope of what can come. But also of those in diaspora community of the importance of energizing the consciousness about the identity of Sikhs, about the rights of, 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 of Sikh community, and of the potential there is of working to, to have those rights delivered and then have this storytelling as a way to energize all of us. So I also want to thank and pay tribute to the author, Gamit Kaur, for undertaking this monumental task and for producing such a, such a fantastic book. I had a quick glance to it on a PDF version. I look forward to quietly re reading it and giving it to my students as an example of what one can do and what one should try to achieve. Um, I think it's, it's right to really focus uh, on who just once in Kalara was and in fact his name now is synonymous with the issue of the genocidal massacres the enforced disappearances and extrajudicial killings of thousands of Sikhs between 1984 and sadly 1995 uh, Mr Kalara being the last victim of the very crimes that he was exposing Truth is perhaps one of the most powerful weapons um, and Mr. Kalara understood and recognized that when truth is brought to light in the way that he exposed, um, it has a very powerful impact that we shouldn't always measure these things by results. Um, just one thing, Kalara paid the ultimate price. He knew in his heart of hearts, if you speak to his family, he knew his destiny. And he knew the only way that this could be brought to the world's attention was that if he made such a huge sacrifice, which is what he did, um, he had to become the last victim of the very enforced disappearances that he was exposing in order for the world to see that this wasn't, this was so brazen that even when a human rights activist stood up and tried to hold the state to account, he himself in broad daylight was abducted, murdered, and then his body was thrown into the Harike River, which was just completely unacceptable, but shows you the level and volume of uh, these human rights violations that were taking uh, place in Punjab. So I'd just like to uh, again conclude by thanking uh, uh, Gurmeet Gaur Banji for uh, a wonderful book. Please everybody uh, try and uh, buy it and uh, it will help you understand uh, more about his life and his background. And uh, please follow uh, the work that we're trying to do. Our website is Punjab Disappeared 
and uh, we'll hopefully keep everyone updated on a regular basis in terms of the litigation. I would like to just uh, highlight like my father's last speech in Canada where he emphasized uh, how important uh, it is for the six to actually uh, go tell their story uh, about all the human rights abuses that uh, they have been facing, uh, not just to the legal courts, not just to the judicial courts, but to actually go to people's court, to go to the people's court worldwide. And I think this is uh, one of the opportunity uh, we as a Sikh in the entire community, uh, we should always seek for like wherever it is possible to connect to uh, uh, whichever organizations which can represent uh, the human rights uh, work that has been done and to tell our story, our narrative, and not what, what the government has been telling for, for a long time. Exactly 36 years ago in the year 1984, I was a young girl of 15 years. I was surrounded by an angry mob who had set our home on fire. And I was desperately trying to escape with my parents and younger siblings in a city called Indore, located in the center of India, far away from Punjab. After the political assassination of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, her party vowed a revenge with the blood of six in India. The state machinery set out to a carefully orchestrated plan, mobilized its volunteers to burn, loot, kill and rape in every part of the country. Rest of the nation, except a few good Samaritans, joined their hands, no matter their political affiliation. After facing three days of terror, arson, and assault, we somehow escaped the hands of the mob, all five of us running in different directions. We had barely made it alive, but my three cousins were not so lucky. In the northern city of Kanpur, all of, all of them in their 20s were burnt alive in front of their widowed mother, one in front of his wife and a two-year-old daughter. Such was the case with thousands upon thousands of other Sikhs throughout every major city and town of the country. Their dead bodies were hauled away in garbage trucks and secretly disposed of. They did not even make the official figures of the programs that the media later reported as natural reaction of the nation upon the political assassination of their beloved Prime Minister by her Sikh bodyguards while propagating them as Delhi riots. For 36 years, my generation has been living with the oozing wounds of 1984 that will never heal. Yet, we did not have the heart to tell our tales to our children. How could we? The tales were too gory, too cruel for a child's heart. And for years, we were made to believe that somehow we ourselves were responsible for this carnage. There has not been one single book about 1984 that would have educated our children about the recent past. For years, I have been fearing what happens when my generation is gone, carrying our wounds alone without telling our children what really happened. That is why I wrote this book. Post-1984 and until the mid-1990s, disgruntled by the June and November genocide, Punjab entered a period of civil unrest in its quest for sovereignty. Backed by the government, the Punjab police and national security forces went on a killing spree to curb the insurgency. Along with the armed militants, the police also picked up their innocent families, neighbors, sometimes all the young men of the entire village they belong to, their aging mothers and their fathers, their wives and their sisters, unlawfully detaining them, torturing and killing them in faked encounters and secretly disposing of their bodies, just as they did in the June and the November pogroms of 1984. But this time, one man was determined and destined to end this business of secretly disposing of the dead and set out to unearth the enormity of the genocide by collecting the evidence of the crime in order to bring the truth to the world in order to stop it. 
He gave his life in search of the lost sons and daughters of Punjab, 25,000 of them. Hence, his story is not his alone. It is that of all disappeared men and women of Punjab who were denied not only a right to live, but a right to their last rights, who were denied the right to be counted, whose stories we never told our children. It has been 25 years that Jaswan Singh's extrajudicial murder brought human, human rights abuses against Sikh to the light of the world. And in these 25 years, we have almost started to forget him. The work he had started is almost at standstill since a few efforts that you heard about. While an entire generation is gone, the eyewitnesses are dying off, the proofs are being destroyed, documents from the crematoria where the mass cremations took place are being sealed. After the genocide, the government is banking on the memory side of our people. But we won't let that happen, would we? We will pass on the story of the 20th century Punjab to our children. And that is why I wrote this book. Our children have grown up embracing and loving their neighbors, have learned from civil rights leaders and human rights defenders from around the world. They stand up for Black Lives Matter in the USA and the indigenous lives in Canada. They stand up for the violation of the Kashmiri rights and Dalit lives in India. Yet they don't know how badly they themselves have been wronged and that they need to stand up for their rights as well. They need to be inspired by their own heroes like Jaswan Singh, who spent his life standing up for others, the laborers, the peasants, the poor, the Hindus and the Muslims, when it came to standing up for his own, he did exactly that too. And with all his might, while teaching us that Khalsa was formed to defend the human rights of all. But if you cannot defend your own rights, you will not be able to define Khalsa to the world. So our children can learn from our own heroes about their own past and ch chalk out a plan for their future. That is why I wrote this book. But why did I write the book for children, you may ask? I believe that if we don't educate them through our stories when they are young, they will most likely shun the topic when they are older and be content in believing what they have been fed via the state-sponsored propaganda on the internet. I have seen this happen with my own generation, even in my own family who went through the same experiences that I did. Teaching history to the children provides them with a sense of identity. It improves their decision-making and judgment and shows them models of good and responsible citizenship. It also teaches them on how to learn from the mistakes of others. It helps them to understand change and development. History provides them a context from which to understand themselves and others. I refer to this Native American saying often, you don't know where you're going until you know where you're coming from. Without teaching them the 20th century history, how do we expect them to shape the 21st century? But since this book is for children, it has to be engaging and stimulating and be full of good moral examples for them to follow. And that is where our hero and his thinking at every phase of his life comes into play as a role model for our children to follow even when he was as little as the age group I wrote this book for. The book is structured so that the heartwarming story of our hero interweaves with the threads of the history of the 20th century Punjab that he lived and interacted with, including the events that led up to the 1984 genocide and post-1984 disappearances. The book goes a little back and takes the readers on an interesting journey on Kamagata Maru, the ship on which Jaswan Singh's grandfather, along with his 375, 76 Punjabi co-passengers, was denied entry into Canada in guise of exclusionary laws. The incidents that later led to the reforms in the country's immigration laws. It takes them to the Gadar movement initiated by the Punjabis for the independence of India from the British to which his grandfather dedicated the entire, his entire life. 
through the price they paid for the Indian independence, the devastating 1947 partition of Punjab that took a million lives and was witnessed by his family being on the border of India and Pakistan, it takes the readers to the contribution and sacrifices of the Sikhs in the two Indo-Pak wars from just one's childhood and then into the Punjabi Suba movement that ended in 1966 with the truncation of Punjab yet again when he was merely 14 years of age. It takes them through the national emergency of 1975 imposed by the dictator dictatorial regime of Indira Gandhi to the Anandpur Sahib resolution that sought the lost rights pertaining to the land and waters, the economy and the language of the people of Punjab, along with the rights to practice the Sikh faith without interference. The asking of which painted them as a communal and an anti-national community. It discusses the, the, in details just one Singh's views on the resolution and the philosophy behind his views. It takes them through the provocation of 1978 that led the Sikhs to take up arms against the government to the massacres of 1984, leading up to the mass disappearances and illegal cremations until 1995, until just one Singh's own disappearance. He never ever scared of anything. Uh, he will just do everything. And his sort of word was like, there's nothing which is unachievable. He organized to write letters to the uh, political uh, parties, to the head of the countries, to the UNO, to the Commonwealth. And that's, that's where actually we started all the work. I know it's very uh, easy or difficult work when you are doing something just in Punjab. That time to fight in Punjab was very, very difficult to even protect yourself. Uh, if we take examples of very other uh, martyrs, even the Jathedar Kaunke, who was a very important person in uh, the Sikh history, no one could have protected because it was not become international better. Even in the future, if we want to protect someone or protect any movement or human rights, we have to work internationally because in India, in Punjab, you cannot protect yourself or you cannot protect the weakest.